Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com today taking your questions on apprenticeships, replacing catalytic converters, bore scopes, and more. This is episode 245 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. If you want to get a question on a show like this, be sure to email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Put question for Charles in the subject. Ask that question right at the top, then give me the details of the question. Also, be sure to ask a question. I've had to reply to like 40 emails just this morning because they weren't actually asking me any questions, so be sure to ask an actual question. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this, be sure to check that quick videos playlist on YouTube where I do one question per video. If video is not your thing, the Q&A shows, as well as many others, are also in audio-only platforms on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, and of course over at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. They make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi, so check them out at CRPAutomotive.com. And remember, if you want exclusive content from me, as well as discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, MyCanic, Petrolbox, Kerma TDI, Adams Polishes, and a whole bunch more, check out that crew membership program, a great way to support the show, as well as score yourself some awesome discounts. All right, with that wrapped up, let's hit these questions. First one up is from Habib. I'm a young guy from Nigeria, aspiring to build a career as an automotive technician. Currently undergoing a one-year training, after which I plan to migrate to Canada and kickstart my career. As a Canadian resident and a professional mechanic, do you think it's better that I get into a Canadian institute to gain some form of education or certification, or can I start my career straight up and gain more experience along the line? If you think I should get formal education, which community college would be good enough for me to learn about the job? Your response is highly anticipated because I need to decide on the next steps to take in my life regarding my career and wouldn't want to take a wrong one. Thank you, sir. All right, great question. So first of all, I'm not Canadian, but that's okay. That does not really matter for the question. The main question here is, do I go to a community college, some sort of formal programming, or do I jump right in the field? If you said you had no training at all, I would probably lean. Now, this is just me. I can't tell you what you should do. This is just kind of what I would do. I would lean more towards going to tech school because you don't have a foundation of any kind to build on. You said you're in a one-year program, you know, without really knowing how that works, what it is, what you're learning. It's going to be really hard to say, but I kind of feel like if you've already done sort of a core training, now it's time to get out in the field, get into an apprenticeship, which I know Canada has, I think, that where you actually have to do an apprenticeship, which I am a thousand percent for. I think it does much better things for the industry and that not as necessarily a replacement for tech school but in addition to tech school. So what I would look at doing is I would look at first going to an apprenticeship, and that could be at a dealer, that could be at an independent shop, right? Canada's a big country, and so there's a million different places that you could go and work and try to gain this apprenticeship. We hear a lot of negative about tech school. You don't learn anything. They suck. It costs too much money. And for a lot of people, that's actually true. For me, it was a great experience because I knew nothing. Like, you probably couldn't have known less about cars as a whole than I did when I started tech school. So if you had no foundation, I would lean that way. Now, even though I think tech school is great, I had a great experience, and I think for a lot of people, it's well worth the investment in yourself. It is in no way, shape, or form a replacement for in-the-field experience. And that's where I think the tech school and the negativity kind of gets muddled together because shop owners and managers are expecting these tech school kids to come out and know like everything about everything. And that's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So if it were me, man, I would, I would really look first at trying to get into a good apprenticeship program with a brand you like, a car you have an affinity for, whatever, something close to your house, right, whatever the reason is, and start your career that way since you've already had some training. Had you had no training, we might go the other way, but I would look at the apprenticeship again. All the sitting behind a, a computer, right, and learning that way, all of that cannot replace actually getting your hands dirty and putting wrenches on cars, plugging scan tools into cars, customers' cars where it's not bugged by an instructor, things where you really have no idea which direction it could take. No amount of book learning is going to replace that hands-on experience. So I would go hands-on over more education. Don't forget, you're going to be learning things every day. You're going to still need to have that tenacity and that focus and that drive to absorb all of that information. Just because we're getting dirty during the day fixing cars doesn't mean we're not gonna spend our nighttime with our nose in a book or watching videos or something like that, trying to learn 
because you're going to be behind everyone else at the shop. So you want to work extra hard to make sure that you're spending your apprenticeship time wisely. All right, next one up is from Jim. I like your style and informative videos. I'm stuck replacing the cats up to the manifold on a 2005 V5 and a half Passat wagon for motion. I'm assuming this is a V6, not a W8. The pre-cats are too big to sneak by the transmission, so my question would be, would your VW training videos have this type of replacement? Form say to lower the back of the subframe, supporting the engine, but I'd like some more opinions. My Bentley manual is useless. Any help is appreciated. I will definitely subscribe if these training videos are good. Regards, Jim. Well, whether they're good or not, Jim, is really going to be up to you. If you're talking about the premium membership stuff, uh, nothing about four motions on uh, replacing cats on four motions. That's way, way, way old stuff. A lot of what we talk about in the premium side is brand new or newer type technology. Uh, I've never done a video on how to replace these cats. They kind of suck, but the forum's right in this case. Dropping the back part of that subframe is going to give you enough room to get it out. Sometimes it's a matter of holding your mouth right, uh, the correct swivel wobbly sockets and extensions to get on those bolts to get them loose from the manifolds. Again, assuming this is a V6, not a W8. I don't know that I've ever put cats on a W8 before, so uh, I don't have any advice there. But on the V6, I have done a handful of them. And yeah, you basically loosen the back of the subframe. I always loosen the sub front of the subframe too. I would support the engine with an engine sling and just lower it down as far as I could. And then you can get access to it. It does kind of suck, but it's totally doable. It's not the worst thing ever. It's better than doing a power steering rack on that same car, uh, by the way. But yeah, be patient. Lower the back of that subframe down. You're going to actually take the engine from sitting like this, if this were the front, and you're going to lower it down a little bit. That's going to give you that clearance between the subframe, the transmission, the catalytic converters. You're going to need to unplug the oxygen sensors. I would saturate that with penetrating oil. It doesn't mention where you're from, but if you're from anywhere where rust is an issue, it's probably going to be ultra rusted, even down here in the south. Uh, you'd probably get quite a bit of oxidation. I mean, remember, an 05 is knocking on the door of 14 years old, if already not 14 years old. So lower it down. Make sure that you support the engine. I usually would use the hoist that supports it from the top. That works really well. I'll link one up that I have. It's actually on the Mark III right now down in the description if you want to use that. I have also used a uh, screw jack to support it from underneath, kind of whatever you have at your disposal. Uh, I'm going to guess you're probably working at the house. So you're going to be laying on the ground, which makes this job quite a bit more challenging than it would be up on the lift. But either way, it's really not that hard. A couple things to keep in mind in addition to that. Usually by now, that clamp that holds, or clamps, I should say, that holds the uh, cats to the rest of the exhaust is probably rusted. That may be something you want to look at replacing. Also, technically, the bolts for the subframe are one-time use. They are torqued to yield. So you want to keep that in mind. In addition to that, when you tighten those bolts back up, you really want to pay attention to where they came out of. Now, you can take the bolts all the way out. That's usually how I did it. But you can also just loosen them so at least the subframe's hanging on the bolts rather than putting the suspension in a bind. You're probably going to be okay either way, but uh, just something to keep in mind. And again, those bolts are torqued yield. But my point with not taking them out all the way, when you tighten that, you really want to pay attention to the witness marks. What that means is that bolt, all the bolts have washer heads on them, right? They're captive, but they're there. And that leaves an imprint on whatever it's tightened to. That imprint that it leaves is called a witness mark. As you're tightening that back up, you really want to try and get those witness marks lined up. That may mean taking a pry bar and tweaking the subframe back, forth, side to side, whatever, so that you can really get that bolt lined up properly. This is going to help make sure that the alignment's as close as possible. Technically, in addition to technically <laughs> replacing those bolts, you do need to get an alignment done on the vehicle. Shifting the subframe is actually how camber and caster are adjusted. There's not technically a caster adjustment, but you can tweak it just a little bit by shifting the subframe, but that is how you do uh, the camber adjustment on that car. So when you loosen it, you're technically supposed to realign the vehicle. So the job's not super fun to do, especially on jack stands, but it is doable. The forum's right, lower the subframe, be super careful, support the engine. This is probably also a good time to look at maybe replacing engine mounts. 
The engine mounts on the B5, five and a half cars, are notorious for leaking. They leak a purple fluid out of them. So good time to get all that done. Those cats are probably super expensive still, so you may have blown the whole money load on cats and not have any extra for those mounts, but that is something you want to take a look at. All right, next one up is from Christopher. Hope you had a blast at SEMA. Man, I did. You know, I actually, for the first time, was bummed leaving SEMA because I worked so hard all week that I only had about two hours to actually see the show, but I made some great contacts, some cool projects coming in 19, and let's just say we might be installing Air Ride on a car next year, uh, so I'm really excited about that. But let's get back to Christopher's question. I'm an enthusiast who finds himself in trouble sometimes, but hey, all in the name of learning, boy, can I relate. I have a direct injection vehicle, I run a catch can, and want to ensure it's doing the job by looking at my intake valves. Do you have a favorite bore scope you recommend? The snap-on one is 280 Canadian, which is okay for occasional use, but surely there's a less expensive, just as functional tool. Amazon has a lot of offerings. Hoping you have insight separating the wheat from the shaft. Thanks, Christopher. Okay, I have tested probably 10 of those Amazon bore scopes. The Autel one, initially I thought wasn't bad, the problem with it is the light's not bright enough, and as someone pointed out, that's the whole point. So if you can't provide any supplemental lighting, which you're not gonna be able to do when bore scoping those intake valves, it's probably not the best choice. In fact, I've used it for that exact thing, and it was all right, but not awesome. I've also tested a handful of those like 10 to $30 Amazon ones, ones that you know hook to your computer or uh, hook to your phone, right, that you use on your phone. I have to say, I wasn't impressed with any of them. Um, either the scope didn't work right out of the box or it was finicky. The thing I found the most annoying is that the bore scope would probably work. It was the software for it that was just awful. So if you get one that's app driven for your phone, whether it's Android or iPhone, the big struggle for me was the actual interface not working properly. Uh, cutting out, not starting, not recording, which was one of the things for me because I'm creating content for you guys was a big deal. For a lot of you, that may not be an issue. The thing I would definitely make sure you look at though, and this becomes a balance of size versus function, is I really like the five, five and a half millimeter size bore scopes instead of the ones that are quite a bit bigger like the eight millimeter ones. Now, if you're going into a spark plug well, not a big deal if it's a little bit bigger, but if you're trying to go through the intake manifold and get around the intake plates and really drive to where you can see the valves, you want the smallest one possible. The problem with that, it is going to be smaller. So there's going to be less LEDs, probably a smaller camera, so it may not have as high of resolution. You know, the good thing is, is most of these are only 30 bucks. So if you buy it and it works four times, it sucks to waste $30, but at least you got it done. Um, I have used some pretty high-end ones that are in the five, six, seven hundred dollar range, and they work much better. But as an enthusiast, is that something you really want to spend? Let me put it this way: I didn't spend that money as a professional, so I would not really feel good about recommending an enthusiast who's going to use it three times a year at the most spend that kind of money. Now, if that's what you want to do, go on and do it. I think that's just fine, but. For most of us, that's not a super good use of, of your money. I also tested one with Eastwood, and it worked okay. It worked a little bit better, but again, my need for it isn't just, you know, driving the borescope, looking at the picture. I need video capture so that I can capture that for you guys. So give one of them a try. If it's $15, $20, and it doesn't work amazing, then cool. Uh, and if it works, again, for that four, five, six times that you might use it, then I think that's a good use of your money. If any of you guys have any experience with good quality borescopes, not junk, the good stuff, drop a link down in the comments and let's help Christopher out. I can also test out some of these as well. I just overall haven't been super impressed with most of those, uh, so I have a hard time really recommending them. If I'm not happy with them, I'm not gonna recommend it for you guys to, uh, to spend your money on. If I wouldn't buy it again, then it's probably not worth buying the first time. So Christopher, I wish I had a better answer for you, unfortunately unless you get in the real high-end stuff where you can actually move like the camera head and things, it's really challenging to find a good quality one that delivers and is bright enough for you to actually see in a essentially pitch black environment. All right, last one of the day is from Yancey. Hey Charles, love the show. Learn a lot about my TDI because of your R32 series. Outstanding. My question is, I have a 97 Audi A4 and was visiting my parents in Vegas. On the way back home on an incline, I lost all power to the wheels 
and a whining noise. I still have power at the engine. I couldn't drive it home, so the car stayed six months at my parents'. Today I tried driving it, and it drove. Any idea what the issues could be? Clutch, maybe? Thanks in advance. Um, okay, so this question, I have no idea. There are a thousand things that could cause this problem. You know, it was six months ago, so were we dead of summer? Were we cold of winter? Doesn't really apply in Las Vegas, I guess. But was it 110 in the desert? There are so many things that could be wrong with the car to cause this problem that how do we begin to diagnose it? And this is actually more of a problem, I think, in a couple of ways. One, we as customers, because I'm a customer too, we as customers have this expectation that you can say a couple of things and someone's going to know exactly what the issue is. This is a huge problem for us as technicians because the information is so limited the only thing I can do as a technician, right? If I got the RO saying this, six months ago something happened and the car lost power, the only thing I can do is I can scan codes, I can do a visual inspection, right? That may or may not get me anywhere. But the only thing I can really do is try and duplicate the concern. And because it only happened one time six months ago, you know, really, what are the odds that it's going to do it again? Now, had you told me it was still doing it, okay, maybe we're looking at a blown turbocharger, that kind of thing that would cause kind of what you're, you're talking about, a clutch, maybe? I, I don't know, right? And the problem is, is I can never know. Guys, even though I think today we have this amazing internet of things with endless information that gives us good advice and good insight and we can learn about all the systems of the car and how it works, how to do a lot of this stuff ourselves, There is, we are not at a point yet where that, the internet, can replace a good technician because a good technician is gonna go through this car top to bottom with visual inspections and they're going to attempt to duplicate it. And the problem is, if I got this RO and I drove it, it's probably gonna be fine. At that point, you know, I found nothing definitively wrong with the car. What do I do as a technician? Okay, I'll recommend maintenance because it needs it anyway. Um, I can throw out some ideas of what it could be, but ultimately I don't know. And as a technician, that's really one of the most frustrating things and for a customer too, right? You bring your car to me with a sporadic problem. I have it for a week and do all the things I can do to it to try and make it fail and it never fails. Now we're at kind of a standoff point where you as a customer are mad because I haven't fixed your car. I'm, as a technician, frustrated because I've spent a bunch of time that I'm probably not gonna get paid for, uh, which is not your fault as a customer, but I've spent a bunch of time and I have no more information really than I did when the car came in the door. And this is, again, one of the most frustrating points. So I think as technician, and I know we're a little off topic, but not really, as a technician, and a customer, instead of butting heads with each other, the best thing to do is try and work together as a team, right? Instead of customer versus technician, it should be customer and technician versus car. We, customer and technician, are in it together to fix car. So the car, right, car can be the bad guy, we can be the good guys. And, and that's challenging, and it's hard to wrap your mind around as a customer when you've paid a bunch of money and you got no more information. It's hard as a technician, because again, you've spent a ton of time and you have no more information. So. Dude, the, the truth is I don't know, and I, I, I could throw out a hundred things and five things that you could check, 10 things you could check, but ultimately, it's just throwing darts at a dartboard and guessing. And it's not even in a way where I feel confident that's an educated guess. It's purely just a shot in the dark type of guess. So, you know, what, what do you do now? Maybe you bring it into a technician and have them evaluate the car, tell them what happened. Maybe they'll drive it and pick something up very minor that you didn't realize was happening because it was a slow thing that build, 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 and now it built so far at that point to failure, maybe the technician can recognize that little little problem. We also, you know, as technicians are gonna look at things again like maintenance and wear and tear on the car, and what are some things that could be leading to a failure? Spark plugs, fuel filter, timing belt, oil leaks, turbocharger failure, diverter valve failure, right? All the things. And maybe begin to develop a plan. But the big thing here is that we haven't found a problem. But it may all come down to we haven't found an actual problem with the car. <sighs> and that's really, really frustrating. So dude, I wish I could help. I, I just, I don't know. And I, I can never know. And unfortunately, that's one of the hard things that I have to tell people 
in the digital world that I exist in, because even putting my hands on the car, we may come to the same conclusion of, uh. And if we came to that conclusion, that is what it is, it's unfortunate, but reproducing sporadic problems is really one of the hardest things for everyone when it comes to fixing your car. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do. You like the video, thumbs up, always appreciate that. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you guys so much for watching or thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time.